Well, today I'm joined by my good friend, Warren Farrell. Uh, we've spoken twice before about this remarkable book, amongst other things, uh, which I still go on recommending to everybody who really wants to understand what's going wrong with uh, our culture and with our society. Uh, but today we turn to something that's important for the whole world, not just for Americans. It's the state of America today following the, uh, uh, the recent elections and the transfer of uh, the White House, indeed the Congress and now uh, the Senate in America to the other side of politics, to that represented by former President Trump. Um, and the reason I was so keen to talk to Warren is that he has written an utterly brilliant essay that I think ought to be compulsory reading right across the world uh, called Healing the Soul of the Nation, How It Can Be Done Even With Trump on Trial. Uh, and uh, it's very powerful because it goes to the need to recognise, as I see it, why so many people, decent people, who can't be written off as deplorables or shouldn't be written off as deplorables, were so passionate about upsetting the system that they voted for and then continued and still continue to support an outsider and a maverick and a very, very unusual president, to put it mildly. They feel rejected, and we're in danger of locking in the rejection, locking in the division, rather than healing, despite the talk from incoming president, I'm sure well-meaning, about healing and division. But if I could, I'd just like to begin. Um, after your graduate, undergraduate study in social science, you did a master's and a PhD then in political science, um, at very uh, prestigious American universities. Uh, at the same time and afterwards, you were a feminist activist and profoundly influential at that. The only man to be elected three times to the National Organization for Women and once lauded as the world's preeminent male feminist. I presume that you were committed to the democratic side of politics throughout that uh, period. You've done a lot of work too in relationship counseling and uh, speaking throughout the world. You ran uh, as uh, for the Democrats, for governor of California. You were public in your support of Hillary Clinton's run for president. Her opponent has now been and gone. Can I ask you, Warren, what first drew you to be committed to the Democrat side of politics? And how would you say it's changed over the years? And how does it feel as a Democrat to see the end of the Trump era? Yeah, uh, really three good questions. Um, I was committed to the Democratic side more because um, they seem to be very inclusive. They seem to be um, supporting women's rights and women's issues, which I felt very passionate about at that time. Uh, they, they were opposed to the war in Vietnam uh, to a greater degree than the uh, Republicans were. Uh, the uh, Republicans were sort of oftentimes saying you were unpatriotic. Um, if you were opposed to the war in Vietnam, I felt the war in Vietnam was a mistake. I talked to President Johnson very briefly about that, um, but it was, you know, it, it, um, and he seemed to be receptive, but it, it, it you know, it ended as it ended um, and very, in a very much more complex way. Um, and the, uh, and so it was really a very, um, uh, the, I, I was, I was not in favor of, um, I saw early on that guns were often used more frequently to, uh, for for people to kill themselves and or kill others than to be actual uses of safety. I didn't see the government as being likely to invade homes. I thought that if the government wants to get you, they'll get you with tax, tax, um, <laughs> uh, making your tax life miserable. And or there was many, many more sophisticated ways the government's had, um, and increasingly with drones, et cetera, to to kill you, if, to quote, kill you if if they wish to. So the, the guns as a defense against the government. Uh, that what made sense um, a few hundred years ago did not make uh, sense these days as as much as the downside. And so all those things spoke Democrat to me. However, your second part of your question is what's happened to the Democrats and what's happened to the Republicans um, in my to my deep, deep regret. Uh, the Democrats have become the enemy of the family, the enemy of fatherhood. 
Uh, they put they put women's uh, it, when at the beginning of when I supported feminism, uh, the basic theme. There was always a victim side of feminism right from the beginning, but I forgave that side for the other part of feminism, which is you know which was sort of expressed in you know I am woman, I am strong. And more recently, it's been, I am a woman, I've been wronged. Um, and the, <laughs> this um, transition to, to victim feminism um, it, uh, as almost the complete um, side of feminism. So, for example, the hashtag Me Too era. I am strongly in favor of, of women speaking up and saying what they feel, how they've been hurt, what's, uh, uh, what, what has been painful for them uh, that men have done with them in their life. But... Hashtag Me Too can never be a monologue. It must always be a dialogue. For each for each woman who has been hurt by a man, there's been a man that's been hurt by a woman. The difference is that men have been uh, much more silent about it. And when we both listen to each other and hear each other's perspectives, like I've I've been at, I used to do role reversal dates and men's beauty contests on college campuses all around the world, and. Um, I said to the women in the um, I said to the men in the audience, listen, if you really came here to understand women, understand that every woman is in a beauty contest every day of her life. Uh, if you it is not good enough for me to tell you that you need to experience that just for a little you know, half hour or an hour. And so if you are open to experiencing that, come up on stage. And then I had uh, the women sit as judges in that beauty contest. And the, the women um, chose their, ultimately chose their top uh, males. And you can see this on my YouTube channel that I did with Tony Robbins and other place, people like that uh, for, his, for his people. Um, and the, uh, the women, uh, the guys at the end of that men's beauty contest said things like, oh, my God. Here I focused for this last 45 minutes on doing everything I could to be chosen as the number one most attractive male, uh, knowing that that would also get me to have the women come up and ask me on the role reversal date that you're setting up. And so, um, and now that I've been chosen as one of the top five or six attractive males, I'm angry that um, only my beauty is being focused on and not, you know, who I am as a person, not my values and not everything I've developed that I consider the most important parts of myself. And I'm, and when men said that, they got, the, the women went, oh, my God, thank you. You finally get it. Conversely, I said, that, you know, this is a role reversal experience. So I'm going to ask the women to experience some of the things that men experience. So I had every w women sit according to the amount of money they thought that they would be making five years after graduation or if they were already graduated, uh, the amount of money that they were making. The women who made the most sat in the front uh, rows, women who made the least in the back rows. Very often the women that were made the least in the back rows. Uh, were also among the most attractive women um, in the in the audience, and so I trained the the, the men to think about them not themselves, but their their children and the the the, the the women, that the women in the front row were the most able to get, take care of their children. Um, and then I asked the women, I said, usually men risk uh, sexual rejection. So this time I want you to go up and compete for the guy, not that you think will say yes to you, but the guy that you are most attracted to. And so the women did that sometimes. Sometimes they just went for the guy that they uh, thought would say yes. And at the end of that process, Woman after woman said things like, oh, my God, um, every time in my life when I've used the word jerk, I've used that word to apply to a man. Today, I, there were six women competing for this, the, the number two guy in the um, men's beauty contest. And um, and I Start, I, so I started saying things like, well, come out to the best restaurant in town with me. Uh, I'll pick you up in my Porsche. Well, I don't have a Porsche and I can't afford the best restaurant in town. Uh, and, you know, and, and then when I saw the other women uh, sort of moving in and still winning, nevertheless, I took the guy by the arm and pulled him away from the other woman. Now, if a man had done that to me, I'd call that sexual harassment. I'd maybe slap him in the face. But here I was doing that to a guy because I was so fearful of being rejected. I became the jerk that I have always accused guys of being. And that's the type of dialogue that needs to happen, not hashtag me too, women victim, 
but hashtag Me Too uh, for men and women with experiencing each other's uh, life experience. When I've worked with couples, um, women who have accused men of sexual harassment or date rape on, on campuses, I always insisted on getting both together and invariably both came away saying, I didn't realize I gave those that body language cue. I didn't realize I remembered the part I wanted to that served my purposes, but not the part that that I could see now that the woman experienced and the men experienced. For me, that's the future that I want to work toward. So much wisdom in there. Um, and if I can take it back to the macro for a moment, because in a part what you're saying in this essay is that the same rules that apply to the the way in which we can heal our own relationships at close quarters apply to the way you heal a nation. And I think you can carry it right out to the international stage. And I think of the deep admiration I have for America in many of the things it did in the 20th century. Two examples. After the First World War, perhaps with some naivety and not enough follow through, the Americans saw the lack of wisdom in the European approach, summarised by Clemenceau after the First World War, let's squeeze the German orange until the pips squeak. The yes. result of that, another horrendous war only a couple of decades later. It was yes. a disaster all round. Contrast that with the American predominance after the Second World War when they did two remarkable things. Perhaps it's the Irish expression, walk a mile in someone else's shoes before you judge them. Uh, they went into Japan, left the emperor there, went about restoring peace, setting up democracy and rebuilding the economy. Japan is now a friend and an ally and a very responsible global citizen. Think of the Marshall Plan, uh, America, an unpopular president at the time. It's important to note that Truman's opinion polls show that he was deeply unpopular, but he had the courage to work with George C. Marshall to set up the Marshall Plan, 13 billion at that time, a staggering amount of money given to the Europeans two or three years after the Second World War to rebuild a place that was shattered and in a worse mess than it had been when Hitler committed suicide. They rebuilt, they reached out, they found common ground with their enemies and put that aside and worked to build a better future. What has happened? to that understanding of leadership that the Americans demonstrated so brilliantly at times? That's a very broad question, I know, but it seems so relevant to what's happening today. That understanding of the need to really heal seems to have disappeared in the fury to slaughter your opponents. And we saw what that did after the First World War in terms of the wrong attitudes producing the very results you didn't want. Exactly. First of all, the the importance of understanding everyone who's listening that um, you know when Hitler, uh, when Germany felt it was just disgraced after World War One, um, there was there was room available. The pain was great for Germany. The the put down was great. They were they were considered the deplorables. And when the pain is great enough, the snake oil salesman becomes credible. When the when the when the price is high enough, the prostitute appears. And Hitler was the snake oil salesman, and Trump is the snake oil salesman um, that became credible because we there was such pain on the part of people who felt they were heard, they were not heard, that the, that the, that they were discounted, that they were deplorable, and that has been the huge mistake um, of 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 the you know that that led to I think. Um, the need for somebody to say, stick up from my side, and no matter how much of a snake oil salesman he was um, and how narcissistic he was, all of that was forgiven. Uh, we have you know, the great gift of uh, if Biden does become a, a healer, which is going to be a very challenging thing to do, and I hope I um, outline a way to do that um, in that in that article, is that is that he, he will create an alternative to the approach of viewing our opponents as intolerable embodiment, embodiments of evil um, and ourselves as infa infallible incarnations of enlightenment. Um, today, we have Democrats who call themselves progressives. Well, exactly what does, what does that say about what you think of the people who disagree with you? 
Are you regressive? Are you Neanderthals? Conversely, we have Republicans who call themselves patriots. Well, does that suggest that somebody who doesn't agree with you is a traitor? We have to hear that the people who disagree with us need to be heard, not dishonored, and be conscious of the words we use, like progressive and patriot, to make ourselves into this um, in incarnation of enlightenment, uh, while our opponents are you know, the embodiment of evil. I, I understand exactly what you're saying. And again, from my own experiences, when I was um, in, in government in Australia, we had a right wing movement that emerged in Australia. And the Prime Minister of the day was wise enough not to fall into the trap of describing that movement uh, led by a, a lady as uh, their supporters as being deplorables or language like that. He said, no, yes. we need to go and understand why they feel so disaffected because many of them are actually fine Australians. And so we went out and, and, and I actually did a lot of the polling to find out why people in the regional areas of the state of Queensland in our country in particular felt that they were no longer respected, they were no longer seen as um, uh, fully paid up members of the Australian family. What could we do to address their legitimate concerns? And we set about doing that. Yes. And it just seems to me to be so important for the world that the incoming administration understands that lesson because the failure to do so will alienate forever those people who produce that great upset. And the staggering fact is that huge numbers of Americans who might be described as quite conservative in their personal morality and their personal life, strongly supported Donald Trump, even though you would hear them say things like, I wouldn't necessarily want to live next door to Donald Trump. <laughs> he is doing the things that I think matter yes. and that are important to me, uh, whether it was on the economy, whether it was on religious freedom and what have you. To reject all of that, and, and you talk about this, to, and to sort of look for a rousing cheer for your own side every time you repeal something that he did, yes, without saying, we want to understand why you did that. Yes, we want to understand what's driven you to it. Seems to be to be a fatal mistake, and so out of keeping with the leadership we've seen in the past from America. Yes. I absolutely agree. And, you know, what Biden needs to be asking to start out with is, you know, what fire burns so deep in the bellies of, se uh, of a high percentage of the 74 million Americans who are parents who are telling their children, don't interrupt, don't be bullies, don't be a narcissist. And yet still, while Trump became the manifestation of the opposite of what they were telling their children, nevertheless, in, uh, nevertheless felt so hurt, so unheard that they still voted for him. And so there's something there and that that has to be heard. And, and so and Biden so far has been doing two things. One has been very good. And I think one has been very not so good. And the good thing is that he's he has instead of getting involved with him and Harris um, at the at the uh, on the impeachment and taking sides and putting um, Trump down and saying he's a you know a criminal and so on he's re he and Harris have remained above the fray that I applaud him for on this but the opposite of that has also happened he's been saying when, that on day one when I get into office I will reverse all of Trump's executive orders and now that is exactly leaving every single Trump supporter or Republican who feels that there was some value in, in having an executive order that took away regulations that turned out to be dysfunctional because all regulations have, have with them uh, unintended consequences. And it's, it's helpful to look at those regulations that you make on business or, or um, uh, years later and say which ones have been functional and which ones have been dysfunctional. Certainly Biden can, can find some of 110 executive orders that um, Trump did. Certainly he can find two, three or four that, are, that were useful and important and, and highlight them rather than highlighting uh, the, uh, the one saying, I'm gonna reverse everything he did uh, right away. Second, if Biden really wants to be a healer, 
he needs to do the first thing, a tour of the reddest of red states. Hearing everything, and you know, people say to me, well, what do you think you should say? And the answer is very little. Yep. The, the first- I, I really step, get that. Yes, yes, exactly. And so I really get it, sharing what he's hearing them say, sharing, did I get that right? And if they didn't get the, if, if they feel it wasn't gotten completely or correctly by Biden, for Biden to work on it until he says, do I get it now? And when they say, I got it now, saying, okay, is there anything I missed though? And then when they fill in the missing blanks, um, then also say, is there anything else that you feel I'm, I'm, that you wanted to add that now that I've heard you, now that I haven't distorted you, now that I've gotten everything you say, maybe you feel more secure about my ability to do that the next time around. So you're able to reveal something that you weren't able to re reveal before because you felt it was hopeless for me to, to share that. Now, what they say, what what red state Republicans may say may be really alienating to um, to Biden, but the, the healing comes in the process of largely just feeling heard. I've done couples communication workshops for 30 years, and when people are on the brink of divorce, the most healing thing is for 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 us first, the one person to start listening to what her his partner felt was the cause of being on the brink of divorce. And when the and the worse the divorce, the worse the anger is, the greater the anger, the more the partner who hears th that anger being heard feels this enormous softness come over them, this enormous feeling of like, wow, you know, part of my and not even realizing that so much of my anger had to do with the fact that I never felt heard by you. Um, and so it, it has astonished me over these 30 years to see that that what happens when that first partner begins to create that safe environment for someone to express what's been bothering them, that not only does the anger soften, but the partner who feels heard increases her his respect for the partner that does the hearing and increases their feeling that that person really had courage because on some level, we know we couldn't do that very easily ourselves. And so this is what um, Biden needs to do to, to, be the, to be the medium as well as the message. Right now, his message is, I'm going to heal the nation. But as the medium is very mixed, some, some healing behaviors and some antagonistic behaviors. And, he needs to, and if, he, if he does the antagonistic behaviors, he'll be a hero to the Democrats immediately. But if he does the healing behaviors first, he'll be a, um, a, a, he'll be a healer of the nation. Healers have to start by listening. So two, two points I'd like to pursue out of that. The first is that what so intrigues me about what you're saying is that it reflects on your part, Warren, your acknowledgement that people on the other side of the political divide from where you might comfortably sit are decent worthy, even lovable Americans trying to do the right thing by their family and by their community. You are not in any way accepting the rhetoric that they ought to be rejected because they have a different set of values to that which might be described as left of centre. You're actually embracing them and recognising them as worthy Americans. That in itself has to be the starting point, an antidote to the sort of contempt yes. that, that has entered the public debate. Yes. Yes. And um, to give you a concrete example of that. So um, at the beginning of this election, when the, when when all the Democratic candidates were going out to Iowa, um, I went out and interviewed nine of the Democratic candidates and explained the uh, shared with them uh, what was happening with boys and shared with them the, the boy crisis. Um, a lot of these interviews are on, on my, on my um, YouTube channel. And so you can just get a sense of uh, their response. And about half of the candidates were quite responsive. However, as I followed through, this is the Democratic candidates, as I followed through with the campaign managers, the campaign managers were fearful. And they said, you know, Warren, you're talking a great deal about the boy crisis being a result of um, dad deprivation. And 
we're afraid of talking about dad deprivation because there's a lot of single mothers out there that are wanting to vote for us. And feminists want the, 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 the choice of being able to have the father involved or not have the father involved if they're in divorce mode. They want the choice of being able to have children with being married or not being married. Uh, so we're, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable with my candidate um, articulating these issues, especially during the Democratic primary. Um, he, or, he or she could lose a lot of votes that way. So then I started speaking at these uh, on these issues around to fathers' conferences and so on, and some Republicans heard me. And um, long story short, I got invited to speak to a major um, Republican summit on fatherhood and then eventually at the White House. At the White House, there's 14 people sitting around there. Um, and there is, um, and as I talked about the importance of family and the importance of fathers, there was nothing, nothing but 100%, oh my God, you know, you are speaking to the choir here. You know, we all feel this has been so left out. Now, some of them have felt that, you know, that feminists had really undermined the family and undermined it, um, uh, the fatherhood, which in fact they have contributed to doing. Um, but most of them were just concerned with how do we get the family uh, involved because they see that the, the, fall, the falling down of America um, is very much related to uh, the 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 lack of productivity, uh, the lack of motivation, and the um, the arrogance and attitude um, of so much uh, of so many of the boys in particular, and also the girls, but much more the boys who did not have father involvement, who cannot, who do not feel that there is the tough love. Um, there is the boundary enforcement. There is the encouragement of postponed gratification. There is the encouragement of risk taking. Those last four things are all things that fathers tend to bring to the fa to the family table that tended to be missing in so many boys that are what I call um, in the boy crisis dad deprived. Well, again, I just give a plug to this magnificent book that you've written on this because it's so important. And you and I have talked about it before. And John Gray, of course, author of. Uh, um, uh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Explores these so thoroughly. Um, let me um, uh, tease out then uh, again two issues. Firstly, um, it seems to me one of the great problems we've got is that we've lost our commitment to reason and evidence-based decision making and what have you. The research is absolutely overwhelming on the importance of fathering. And to put it aside because it doesn't suit the frame of mind that we're in or the relationship situation that we're in at any given time, rather than say this is of paramount importance for my children and I'll do what's right for them, seems to me to be part of a terrible price we're paying for not being willing to look at the evidence and allowing ourselves to be driven so much by emotion in this modern age. Yes. And so much by such a focus on the rights of women to be able to raise children by themselves and the rights of women to be able to have the, um, the, the option of whether the father is involved after divorce or whether she can, and you know, passing laws that, like in California, that the, the mother can move out of state if she wishes to and, and take the children away from the father. Uh, it could, te it's technically written, of course, that either parent can do that, but practically speaking, it's almost always uh, the mom that does that. And uh, and not looking at the enormous damage. I mean, when I started the research for the boy crisis, I saw, you know, I, I outlined to my publisher 10 causes of the boy crisis. So I didn't start out with father and lack of father as as the primary cause. But every time I looked carefully, so for example, I saw ch children growing up in mom-only homes or in feminized homes, um, and the uh, when they had f um, when those children had male teachers, they were significantly helped by the male teachers because they had a male role model. However, if they had a father and mother in the family, and then they had no male teachers, it had only a small impact on them. So I started to see that, wait a minute, you know, I, I've, I've told my publisher here that male teachers are as important as, you know, as um, fatherlessness. That doesn't turn out to be true. And I went through one thing after the other like this and realized that the fatherlessness was the hub of the problem. Everything else was spokes compared to the hub. Um, and they were either um, secondary causes 
or they were correlations, but not really causes. And so I started to really focus on uh, the, 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 the suffering that happens when a boy looks in the mirror and sees that the half of him that is his father um, is not, um, he doesn't understand it, he doesn't know it. Um, and, and so the, and then started to see that um, boys without fathers were far more likely to commit suicide. They were far more likely to be uh, drug addicts. They were far more likely to be addicted to video games, far more likely to be addicted to porn, far more likely to drop out of high school, far more likely to not have good reading skills or writing skills, which are the biggest academic predictors of success. Uh, far more likely to not have postponed gratification. Uh, postponed gratification is the social um, skill that is the biggest predictor of, of, of success from the, among social skills. And so these, and so I started asking, well, why don't they have postponed gratification? Why are they more likely to commit suicide? And that's when I began to see the exact things that dads do that you and I discussed in our first interview, like the rough housing, the teasing, and so on, that led to children with a significant amount of father involvement, but not just father involvement, but a checks and balance tension between what mothers bring to the parenting table and what fathers bring to the parenting table. Children need that. And this is not a boys and men's issue because I don't know a single girl or woman who doesn't feel she would have a better life um, if there were boys and men who are worthy of their love or if she's a, a straight, a gay woman, um, men at work that are uh, that are emotionally intelligent for her to work with. So, what's really fascinating and so important, I think, about what you're saying is to take. You can go from the micro, if I can put it that way, to the macro. Um, America and any country is the sum total of the Americans that make it up. Australia is the sum total of the Australians that make it up to the extent that they're able to relate to one another and understand one another properly. The nation flourishes uh, to the extent that they, their relationships are shattered and broken. The nation is weakened. Now, um, and that's what's so valuable, I think, about your set of insights here. Um, and I'm, I think we might have touched on this before, but I just wanted to return to it. Arthur Brooks talks about we see a lot of anger in America, you can see that, and, and I'm not singling America out, you see it in nearly every Western society, if not every society on the planet, but it's got so much worse now, we've lost our moorings. You couple that with disgust and you end up with contempt. And when you have contempt, and that's uh, deplorables is the language of contempt. For yes, example. absolutely. It's so hard to find that common ground and that softening that you talk about when somebody who's seriously misunderstood feels that at last the other person is trying to understand them. It applies at the national level every bit as much as it applies to the household set of relationships, mm -hmm. is what you're saying. Yes. And therefore, the solutions are broadly common as well. Yes. And as you implied a few minutes ago, also on the international level, Imagine if there was really careful listening between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Um, and, you know, the, uh, at almost every, every war, um, the people on both nations on both sides of that war do not feel heard by the people they're at war with. Um, and so there's, it, it is the family level, it is the school level, it is, and you talk to any superintendent of schools or principals, uh, principal of a school, the principal will say, I'm getting this from the parents. I'm getting this from the kids. I'm getting this from the, um, you know, the, the the board of education. I'm getting this from, you know, and and, and nobody understands anybody's perspective. Um, you know, the teachers are saying this has to happen. Um, now with now with COVID, of you know, uh, together, um, you know, the other some the teachers unions are saying we don't want the teachers to go back to school. So people are blaming the unions. They're blaming the teachers. They're blaming the governor. Um, you know, and no one one gets anyone else's perspective and no one um, listens to it. And unfortunately, with um, part of what has happened with Facebook and Twitter and all the social media is that the algorithms are such and the experience is such that the, the more outrageous the conspiracy theory, the more outrageous the, the accusation of the other side is, the, the greater the number of um, the, the greater the, the amount of people um, view it. And so we all have to question the part of ourselves 
that is unwilling, that, that is so much more attracted to slamming people, putting them down, having them be all evil. Uh, this is very Neanderthal. This is very, but Neanderthal in a, in a respectful way. This is built into our evolutionary heritage. Historically speaking, when we heard criticism, the biologically natural response was to kill the criticizer, that the criticizer might be the enemy. And so therefore, we should get up our defenses and kill the criticizer before the criticizer killed us. That was functional for survival in those days, but it is not functional for, this, for love today, and it is not functional for a functioning nation and world that can understand and hear each other, where survival is not nearly as much the focus, uh, especially in the middle and upper middle class, as being able to hear and live with each other peacefully. I understand what you're saying. Now, um, uh, although I would add that there are times when we face forces that are so intent upon disruption and evil that we do have to be prepared to stand very firmly by our values. Totally. Em em empathy should never be confused with a lack of boundary enforcement. They, yes. You must always have both of those together. Yeah. I, it's a very interesting thing, isn't it, that this empathy culture, this idea that we elevate victims to such a status that we never criticise their actions, their attitudes, the way they behave because they, they are victims. Yes. Uh, there are two massive problems with it. One is you can't politely say, look, you really need to change the way you're doing things if you want to escape your victimhood. That's one problem. Yes. The other problem is when you've ever, whenever you've got a victim, you get very angry because there must be a victim maker. There's an oppressor out there. Mm -hmm. And again, it's this division that you're talking about where we can't meet and recognise uh, that uh, you don't get rid of evil by by telling people that evil's the, pro the cause is caused by a whole set of evil people. And if you just get rid of them, if you just cancel them, evil will go away. Yes. yes, we've been around long enough to know that's very naive. Yes, and it also people who are honing victimhood as a fine art, as the feminists are doing today around the world, uh, create a, exactly the opposite of what they want for women. We don't respect professional victims. Uh, we don't expect respect. If, if we had a classrooms of you know feminists saying, "Listen, women, um, in order to not be a victim, you also have to uh, take responsibility for choosing a man that you feel has the energy you would like to um, have in your life, and going up to him and asking him out, and um, sharing responsibility for paying for him." Take the risks of rejection with him. Um, don't just say no. Say what you do want, not what you just what you don't want. Um, and so, um, and then if you overreach yourself in reaching out too quickly to him, and he feels pushed into a corner, and he's blaming of you, be accountable in the same way that you would like him to be accountable if he goes too far too fast. Um, you know, when you say no, don't just say no but also say, in addition to the words no, say, um, he, here is what I would like to have happen. You just reached out to tongue kiss me. I'm not ready to move to the tongue kiss level that quickly, um, but I may or may not be in the future. So rather than you guessing whether I'm never going to be re willing to, be, to go there, or I need more wine to, to relax me, or I need more talk of you to, um, to l know more about you, or more talk of me to have you feel respect for me and pay attention to me, um, or turn the um, stereo up or turn the stereo down or play different types of music, uh, rather than you have to, have to guess all that, I will let you know what I'd like more of or less of from you, and I'll let you know when and if. I am willing to uh, do the tongue kissing again. I'll take responsibility for sharing this process rather than just calling you a sexual harasser or a date rapist um, if you if you guess it um, if you don't guess it right. Yeah. Um, to tease out a little more from your essay, something that on the surface of it's very counterintuitive. Many of our listeners will. You actually argue that precisely because of their commitment to feminism uh, and to, um, uh, if you like, uh, the democratic sort of agenda, Biden is in a unique place to help, uh, uh, President Biden, a, a unique place to help encourage dad involvement. Yes. 
Yes. Can you, um, and, and because as part of the healing process, uh, uh, you know, you make the point that um, uh, law and order is very important. And of course, the Democrats, I think, do have a bit of a problem there. The Black Lives Movement, we do know now uh, just how infested that was with very bad thinking, you know, smash fatherhood, um, do away with the nuclear family. They've removed that from their website. I saw that myself, and you referred to it in the essay. Yes. But there were people behind that movement who were anything but deeply committed to truth and objectivity and trying to re reduce American or injustice uh, that being experienced by blacks, uh, black Americans. But, but you go on to say that, in fact, precisely because of the political positioning, if you like, of the incoming president, he may be able to help people because true feminism, I think this is your argument, if I, and you can respond, will always see the importance of ensuring that boys are doing better. Yes, absolutely. The, so a few dimensions of this, the Black Lives Matter part of it first. Um, the, what's important is, yes, that the, the Black Lives Matter original website, it is 100% accurate, and I read it, um, in, in its original form before they removed yep. this, uh, was so absolutely, it, it completely yep. eliminated fathers. It yep. was avowedly Marxist in its, in its perspective. And it also it com um, completely eliminated and it was opposed to the nuclear family. So the, so, um, and, and, but even more, and as important as that, this aspect of the Black Lives Matter website was so touted with all, by all the conservative media that the great majority of conservatives only saw this Black Lives Matter group as the manipulators of Black Lives Matter and what the goals of Black Lives Matter. So there's, there's this half of America saying the only thing that Black Lives Matter is about is a, a goal of destroying the family, destroying fatherhood, um, and destroying, uh, certainly destroying faith. Um, and so, and, and the uh, the other half of America was was not blinded by that, but they were they were focused on the um, the fact that there was uh, that there was genuine injustice that has been served to so many black people in America for so long. And so the people who felt that, that they wanted to address the injustice that blacks were experiencing were completely oblivious to the to what conservatives were looking at. And, and so therefore they had conservatives pinned as racists as opposed to people who were seeing that what was the Black Lives Matter leadership was, was about was destroying family, de destroying fathers, and destroying, um, uh, the, uh, dis uh, um, destroying faith, because um, Marxism does not believe in, in God. Um, and, so that's, uh, and so listening to the conservative community talk about that feeling, rather than saying, ah, there's something more to it than that, just, just Biden is in a perfect position to address what I call the three F's that are the foundation of um, that of much many conservatism: the fathers, fatherhood, the family, and faith. And you know, Biden was an extraordinary father. He he was one of the very few senators who went home every evening uh, for almost every evening for dinner with his family, um, and he you know helped to raise his children. And he's he's a very strong and avowed Catholic, and so of all the people who's been who have been president recently, um, his commitment to faith, to family, and to fatherhood is among the strongest. So rather than focusing on what appears to be the racism of conservatism, um, uh, focusing on I so believe in the three Fs that are so much that are the foundation of so many conservatives and the importance of you conservatives bringing this to our country uh, because we have seen when we don't have uh, especially fatherhood in the family we truly have um, a, a, a deteriorating america um, and so there's that's sort of part of what i'm saying about that and then with the black lives matter one more thing on that issue the black and with black lives matter all the conservatives were focused on the damage that was being done to stores and so on. And so they were focused on law and order. But suddenly, when the, uh, when the Capitol was invaded by conservatives, um, the liberals were focused on law and order. 
So, you know, hear what what the Republicans are saying about the importance of law and order and 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 apply some of that to law and order evenly, no matter what's being uh, violently protested. And so um, it's this type of, of thing that needs to, needs to be done. In addition to, um, as you know, I talk about, you know, the the way that fatherhood and family um, will reduce the size of government and um, and do some of the other things that Republicans care about. Then uh, if I can um, move to a couple of final issues. One then is, do you believe that there are enough people of goodwill in the incoming administration, given that the Democrats now control the House, the Senate and the Congress, to restrain the wild, hit out at any price ideology that refuses to listen to the other side. In other words, will Biden have the personal strength and just the room to move politically to try and do, as you suggest, genuinely listen and build a high quality empathy in your judgment? Two thirds, no. One third, yes. Meaning that I think like uh, the example I gave a couple of minutes ago, the other is a part of him that is, has remained above the fray um, and not, not sort of, you know, made focused on, yes, he's, I've told you all along that Trump was a uh, criminal. He needs to be convicted. That's a positive. Uh, on the other hand, excuse me, on the other hand, he's also, um, you know, sort of said, you know, I'm going to reverse every executive order that that, that guy, um, you know, sort of passed. And so I think there'll be an enormous pressure from him um, to, um, to, to not express a real compassion for what the, what has not been heard by conservatives. Um, and, uh, there's, especially in the area of, um, of, of fatherhood and family, um, Trump, um, Biden has made his, a lot of his reputation on being the lead person on the violence against women act, a huge amount of his, um, of his constituency are very strong feminists and feminists that want more uh, rights for women. Uh, this is going to be very challenging for him to go against that constituency that put him in, in office um, and be able to hear things that um, that Democrats have not for the last few decades been um, able to hear. It's been basically a half a century now where it's been women good, men men bad. If a man, you know, men, you have toxic masculinity, uh, give me an example of toxic masculinity. Ah, uh, you don't even express your feelings. Okay, so a man expresses his feelings. Ah, uh, you're mansplaining. Um, <laughs> it's sort of uh, you can't you have, win. You can't win these. Uh, you know, um, if he if he if he if he's if you have a son and he's a teenager and he's beginning to feel his um, uh, his attraction to women and he reaches out too quickly, he's a sexual harasser or a date rapist. If he doesn't reach reach out quickly enough, he's a wimp. Um, and so, you know, guys, uh, if he's he's told, um, you know, uh, that the future is female. And so what does that say to the male who feels the future is female? I mean, there, there are so many things happening in the adolescent boy's mind. Um, he's fearful of asking out an attractive woman, woman but the women, uh, unless he is the football player or the student body president, I was student body president. I still didn't get asked out by any woman. Um, you know, I had to do the asking. Um, and so, you know, it was, unless you're the, you're the best looking and, the, and, and the, you know, uh, an achieved celebrity, uh, the women that you're attracted to do not ask you out. And so, but you have to ask them out and take the risks. And so we need to be, we, we need to have a feminism if there's a feminism that is not just a feminism, that is, that is as I said before, um, not a hashtag me too monologue, but rather a hashtag me too dialogue. That feminism has completely missed, will probably continue to miss, and I'm afraid largely Biden will miss a good portion of it because he's so, um, he has evolved from um, that, uh, that violence against women act that all violence against people is really violence against women that has led to the 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 um the extraordinary creation of just women's shelters and and attitudes toward the as opposed to also just also men's shelters and much more importantly 
has led to the ideology that has controlled these um, women's shelters so that if a man, if a woman goes to a woman's shelter, she is not encouraged to do better communication with her boyfriend or husband. She is told to stay away from that man because once a man batters, he will always batter. Despite the fact that for 50 years, we've had you know more than 200 studies that have shown that in, in relationships, men and women hit each other about equally uh, at every single level of violence, including the killing level. And so we have um, an enormous amount of work to do. Um, and so th those are a few of the things that are gonna make it very difficult for Biden. Um, and I think what's going to happen is I predict that the 20, 2024 election, uh, 2000, yeah, 24 election will be between um, uh, um, um, Romney and K Kamala Harris. And I will be very much caught in the middle um, between the things I agree with that the Democrats do and the things that I agree with that the Republicans do. And I could even see myself um, working for the Romney campaign if, if, if Biden does not prove to be a real healer. Well, that's a very profound note to almost end on. I wanted to say something from Down Under, a little Down Under, that may or may not be relevant, but it just strikes me as I listen to you talk and as I read your essay, that one of the things that's absolutely de rigueur if you uh, suffer an electoral setback in Australia, I've been a political leader, and you're rejected in, say, a seat where you thought you were popular and you were going to win, you do a listening tour. It's almost a sort of uh, people make light of it, but actually it's a serious thing. It's expected that you go out and talk to the people who once voted for you but don't, but didn't this time. Yes. And I wanted to finish on that note because I think your finishing sentence is brilliant. You write, the politics on day one, I'll reverse, you refer to that, that's repudiate, push aside, say that, no, that was the product of what the deplorables wanted. That'll make him an instant, the president, an instant hero to Democrats, you say. But on the other hand, the politics on, of um, I'll go out and listen for a month, particularly to those states that didn't support us, to try and understand why so many good Americans took such a different view that would heal the nation's soul. I think you put that beautifully. I commend to anyone who's listening to this, your writings in this area, and in particular, this essay, Warren. I, I just say I, uh, I salute you. I very sincerely do. And you and I can talk freely, um, despite the fact that many people would see us as being of different sides of the centre political line. We both understand that in the end, the nations are some total of the people in it and the way they relate to one another and the broad principles of respecting one another yes. and accepting one another's dignity and being prepared to sit down and try and understand them are as important to the nation, as important to international order uh, as our own personal relationships are for stability in the home and the building up of tomorrow's children. Yes. What greater gift is there to give our children than to see their parents hearing each other, having differences about what's best, you know, the way to bring up our children and hearing mom and dad and saying, you know, mom, this is mom's way of looking at how she can care for you best. And this is dad's way of looking at how he can care for you best. And we differ on this and we're talking it through. And the outcome is this type of compromise, this type of way we hurt each other. And that leads, even if the children have experienced a divorce, not fearful of getting into another marriage for fear that their marriage will end in divorce. Yeah, I heard a, a wise old man say once uh, uh, that uh, in a lifetime of working in the relationship area, uh, the best advice you could give to parents is you can follow whichever particular guru at the moment might seem relevant to you. If you really want to get it right, though, understand that what the children need to know is that mum and dad love each other and are committed to each other and are determined to work cooperatively with one another. Yes, yes. And how sad that we have rejected so much of that wisdom. So, so true. Thank you again. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed talking with you. And I'll put in a final plug. Please read Warren's essay if you've listened to this and not come across the essay. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, 
be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.